uh, then I'm going to go into the project. So the frame for it is human-machine co-creativity in the theater. Uh, the whole story of human android theater starts in Japan, like many things in robotics, which is probably because of this concept, Sonzai Khan. It's the feeling of presence of a person which is not restricted to the body. So for Japanese people, it seems to be quite natural to think of uh, the presence or the ghost of a person to be in, uh, in a thing or in a robot and to interact with it. So this led to a strong appreciation of robots in Japan. And it also led to a joint venture between a theater director famous Japanese theater director and a professor <coughs> for robotics. Uh, it's Orisa Hirata, it's the theater director and you probably know Hiroshi Ishiguro because he grew very famous building uh, very much human-like robots. He calls them Geminoids and you can see uh, this play Sayonara, sorry. And um, the dark-haired girl is a robot and she's interacting with a human on the stage. And they created three theater plays and one film in that way. I'm not going to go into the content, you can ask me later. In the Western society, this concept uh, kind of leads into the uncanny valley. So in the Western society, it started later, and it started like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, with robots uh, actually performing as robots, clearly visible to the audience. This is uh, in Pittsburgh, Sure Thing, performed in 2014. And you can see uh, humans steering the robot in the back remotely. And it, he's also visible to the audience, so it's a very clear setting. This is another example of uh, its silicon love story. Also, the robot is clearly playing a robot. And this is Mion, who performed at the Komische Oper in Berlin in 2015 with Gob Squad. And uh, this is kind of a, a leap forward because Mion is a deep learning system. And uh, they, tried to, they tried the experiment to train this robot to become an opera star, which didn't really work. Actually, he is sitting around a lot on the stage. And, but it's, it's uh, still a leap forward because he's really interacting with the other actors. It's not a pre-recorded thing. It's not a state machine. And the same thing holds true for this candidate. It's the Evan Knight's robot entertainer. This is a robot that can tell jokes and it can perceive the audience. So it can uh, perceive the audience reactions if they laugh and uh, it will pick jokes that are fit for this audience. So it's a little bit like uh, Spotify. This uh, led me to the question, can robots improvise? Because I'm an improviser on stage. And uh, for me, uh, improvisation is kind of the hardest uh, measurement of social interaction. And I started with the assumption that it's not possible, but I found out that people are already doing it. They started in music, and this is probably, in my eyes, the most advanced example of human-machine interaction. That's Shimon, built by the George Tech University, Del Weinberg and Guy Hoffman. And it's a marimba-playing jazz musician uh, that is uh, able to listen to the human players. So you can give an input, a musical input. He or she will listen and then answer with a sequence. Uh, that is not pre-programmed, and he or she will pick styles, and, uh, but improvise free. And Shimon is traveling around the world, giving concerts. Very expensive to book him, I tried to book him. But uh, uh, this is very, very advanced. And um, I thought maybe this could be interesting to trans translate this into theater. But when it comes to language, it gets more difficult. But there are still people doing it. This is Corey Matthewson. He's an improviser and a computer scientist based in Canada. And he's performing with an AI that's called Piggy, which is really a clever bot in disguise. Uh, 
most of you will know Cleverbot, it's a chatbot that's publicly available on the internet. And uh, this is an avatar with a lip sync program, so he can perform on the stage and talk to an AI, to a clever bot, and the AI, the AI is somehow embodied on the stage. So he gives performances with that. And there's another partner uh, in our project, Corey Matheson will be part of our project, hopefully. And Corey Matheson, uh, and Piotr Mirovsky also, he's also an improviser and computer scientist, and he goes one step further, further because he programmed um, a uh, uh, recurrent neural network with a long short-term memory, so this is kind of state of the art, um, called Alex, and this is Corey, uh, Piotr Mirovsky, you've seen him before, and he's performing with a little robot, but the real thing is the technology behind this robot. This robot has been trained on film subtitles, and uh, so it has seen like uh, 100,000 films, or read the scripts of 100,000 films, and so it's kind of, it has some dramatic knowledge in a way. It's still very difficult to improvise with this chatbot. For us, uh, for me, it seems more interesting not to go into the Turing test situation. The Turing test, as you know, is some kind of theatrical situation, if you like. And uh, Piotr Lorowski and Corey Matthewson go in that direction, so they stage a Turing test. But to me, it seems more interesting to um, find out uh, how can human and machine cooperate, collaborate on the stage in a creative way. So not to think of human creativity and machine creativity as distinct, but to think of it as an overlapping concept. This is what we call human-machine co-creativity, and it also uh, applies to other forms of art, of course. So how can we bring together a human and a machine, uh, a dialogical machine, and create interesting, maybe even artistic uh, dialogues? So the idea, the stage setting we are pursuing is this. We'll, and this is, this, this is the design for a couple of experiments. We're going to have two actors on the stage, one performing a human and one performing a robot. We'll interact with the audience, ask the audience uh, in what year are we and what, what role do robots play in this, uh, in this phase of history. And uh, the text of one, the actor, will be the text of a computer, will be fed by a chatbot. And we're going to use Cleverbot, um, maybe Mitsuku, and Alex, probably. And I'm going to go into one that is called Jan, because we're already started, we've already started to interact with this chatbot on the stage. So, what is Jan? Um, he or she is created by Corey Matthews and it finds approximate nearest neighbors using Spotify's Annoy library over a distributed semantic embedding space, which is Google's universal sentence decoder. So, so it, uh, actually it creates a 500-dimensional space and it places uh, sentences in there and finds the next neighbor um, and the answer the computer gives is the next neighbor. So this is something that is semantically probably re relatively close to the input by the human. Everything depends on what data do you train the network on. And we trained it on subtitles, as, uh, as Piotr does. We have like 700,000 lines of sub film subtitles. It works okay, but it's German, and um, we actually need something like the universal sentence encoder for German. So if anybody here is uh, specialized in that, please come to me. And we use uh, lines of pop songs. We have 400,000 lines of pop songs. And this is kind of our invention, uh, which we are pretty proud of because it works quite well. Pop song lines are very direct. They are very emotional. And you can get into a very interesting conversation with a 